While Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney appointed his own daughter to the Department of Homeland Security, a federal agency he had helped create. Even if Ron Paul were a nepotist, it would be irrelevant from the point of view of anyone alive now who thinks in a long-term historical perspective. That is about the caliber of all those charges against Paul leveled by his public detractors. However, there are other people who have a much stronger negative opinion about Ron Paul than those who express their idiocies on TV, and these people are not usually seen on TV or... If they are, it is only very briefly and only in a position of extreme public authority. For example, the owners of the MSM and the chairs of the Federal Reserve Bank, not to mention many of the diplomats staffing the UN and NATO, as well as those economic bureaucrats staffing NGOs like the CFR, Trilateral Commission, the IMF, and World Bank, these people have almost all the money and could very easily have Ron Paul assassinated at any moment. They did it to Democrat President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. They tried to do it to Republican President Ronald Reagan. They could do it to the current Democrat President Barack Obama if they thought he were going to step out of line. That is, in short, the entire essence of the wealthy elite's social authority their ability to press a button and bomb anyone, anywhere from a stealth drone. This is the power that Ron Paul has religiously attacked his entire life, in which, once he is elected president, he will hopefully reverse and overturn. However, there are ominous shadows underlying his role as the New World Order's detractor, considering that they have not yet assassinated him. It allows some pie-eyed conspiracy theorists to question whether Ron Paul is true to his cause, or whether he is some kind of long-term plant sent to infiltrate the Democratic Republic of the USA and subvert all popular dissenters into accepting a New World Order global government. Thus, there are public detractors of Ron Paul, who assail him with empty insults and childish jibes in the MSM on TV. And then there are those who have simply been so wounded and become so jaded in fighting against the New World Order that they actually believe Ron Paul, who is the champion of liberty, is a plant for the elites, a straw man set up to fail as controlled opposition. And this latter group sits silent, watching Glenn Beck and Bill O'Reilly waiting for their chance to vote for Mitt Romney to prove to themselves the futility of attacking a corrupt system from within. The Message and the Messenger Ron Paul has long had a nickname among his fellow members of the U.S. House of Representatives and his colleagues in the Senate. His fellow congresspeople call him Dr. No because he has never voted to raise taxes, has never taken a paid junket, has never voted for a congressional pay raise, and always votes according to whether the bill passes his personal muster for being in line with the letter and spirit of the U.S. Constitution, which has placed him in the hot seat of being the sole nay vote on numerous key pieces of neocon and neolib legislation, such as the USA Patriot Act and the TSA, recent internet censorship bills like PIPA and SOPA, as well as the NDAA relating to indefinite detention and drone assassinations being applied to U.S. citizens. Ron voted in favor of the use of force in reprisal against those responsible for the attacks of 9-11, but endorsed using the constitutional letters of mark and reprisal that would have allowed the U.S. to merc bin Laden using U.S. Navy SEAL Team 6 in 2001, when UBL was still in Afghanistan. Ron co-sponsored the Dodd-Frank legislation to audit the Federal Reserve, but ultimately did not vote for his own bill when it was passed as a referendum against the big investment banks on Wall Street, exonerating blame for the mortgage crisis from the Federal Reserve directly. In short, it is difficult to be the sole voice of opposition within a system, and to daily meet with the disapproval of almost all of your peers within that system, 
without it having any negative psychological impact on one at all. Ron Paul, although he presents a strong image of positivity, often predicts the complete economic failure of the U.S. system, and although he never makes public calls for such, would probably not mind seeing the majority of his colleagues hung for treason. That makes him seem a very ugly sort of person to those in the MSM who refuse to research his actual positions and policies. For example, once an open mic was left on in the White House press room prior to an address by then-Press Secretary Robert Gibbs, and the reporters were overheard discussing Ron Paul. One of them quipped, Only half of us would be here if Ron Paul were the president. It is no secret that by closing five federal departments in his first year as president, Ron Paul's Restore America Now budget plan does call for gradually attritioning more than 5,000 some federal government bureaucrats. In short, yes, under President Paul there would be government job layoffs. The truth, however, is not that these closures would be to attack his political enemies, as implied by the MSM reporter's comments, but that they are necessary to reduce the size of the federal government. The simple fact is that, at present, there are too many agencies being paid by U.S. tax dollars to provide collectively unnecessary and or personally invasive services that impede our cultural progress as a nation of individuals. You can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. The eggs to be broken in this case can either be some 6,000 federal employees thrown out of work and looking for a new job, or they can be the entire tax-paying population who would be made to pay those 6,000 federal employees' salaries by quantitative easing by the Fed inflating prices across the board. Ron shrugs off the insulting nickname given to him by his corrupt colleagues, reminding himself frequently of his wife Carol's joke about how, in Ron's case, it should be spelled Dr. K-N-O-W. However, it is clear that years of being charged by pro-welfare statists and supply-side economists have done some damage to the poor man's ego, because at times in his speeches he has waxed somewhat emotional about being accused of hating the poor. This blanket smear leveled by reactionary provocateurs since Lenin assaults the premise that Adam Smith's conceptual laissez-faire capitalism the ideal free market, is responsible for the moral decay and ultimately the literal bankrupting of the American dream itself. The argument made in defense of capitalism being the American dream by Ron Paul and other Austrian economists is that the ideal free market form of capitalism has never been tried, because as soon as it had been codified as the legal tender law of the USA, large corporations began to form that eventually successfully lobbied Congress to reverse the constitutional ban on direct taxation and to create the Federal Reserve as a U.S. central bank, a disaster the original Founding Fathers had debated against for decades. A true free market, they argue, has a gold coin currency and tough anti-racketeering, and anti-counterfeiting laws to break apart monopolistic corporations and fiat loan agencies. It is thus a fallacy to say that Ron Paul believes the market would regulate itself, because he believes in the use of government to enforce market regulatory laws such as these. It is, however, as he has said, a much more difficult false accusation for him to bear whenever it is said that Ron Paul doesn't care about the poor. The perfect message, liberty. Ron Paul's message is simple. America became great based on the principles of individual liberty as laid out in the founding documents of the nation, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the USA, and the Bill of Rights and ongoing amendments to the Constitution. He believes that when individual liberty is maximized, there will be some people who do things we don't like, but that our own ability to seek excellence and pursue a life of virtue can allow us to lead by example, and thus allow us to preempt the use of force using diplomacy. 
Ron Paul's greatest single contribution to the narrative of the debate at this juncture in history is the simple statement, we should apply the golden rule to international relations. If we wouldn't want another nation doing it to us, we should not do it to another nation. Statements of this magnitude have earned Ron Paul the greatest amount of campaign contributions in both 2008 and now in 2012 from active duty armed service personnel. His first executive order, he has stated as president, would be to bring the troops home. He intends to close all foreign military bases and restation all troops within the U.S. borders. The greatest idea Ron Paul has proposed for his budget plan to restore America now is to allow the circulation and ownership of gold and silver coins as parallel pricing structured competing currency circulating at the same time as U.S. dollar Federal Reserve notes. This sort of idea for not only how to attrition out current social problems, but for how to replace their causes with a better cure that will prevent the symptoms from reoccurring, is truly a feat worth of inspiring such a broad-based social movement as we can find among Ron Paul's Paulite followers. Although Ron Paul has often said, the peace candidate always wins, he has met with great opposition in the MSM from within the GOP, where the majority of candidates backed by the Republican Party are very hawkish pro-war personalities. For as long as he has been in Congress, which has been since the mid-1990s under then-Democrat President Bill Clinton, Ron Paul has decried the drums of war beating to put economic sanctions on Iran, which he has long forewarned us was the neocons' long-term target in the Mideast, a region where Ron Paul believes the U.S. should not be involved at all. Regardless of his position on international relations with other sovereign nations, be they on George W. Bush's Axis of Evil Enemies list, or those in the EU who have been long-term allies of the U.S. and who are now suffering a Federal Reserve-caused economic crisis, Ron Paul's belief in the need to bring our troops home to defend America's borders poses a much larger challenge against the military-industrial complex than his position of non-interventionism being slandered as isolationism in the MSM and Mets. In 2008, when Ron Paul was running for the Republican nomination, journalist Benjamin Fulford interviewed John David Rockefeller Jr. and asked him if he had ever heard of Ron Paul's platform to end the Federal Reserve. Rockefeller's answer was, no, he had not heard of him. It is not for any lack of historical impact his beliefs have on the facade of the status quo in the establishment that the rich elite planners of the New World Order are ignoring the threat to their oligarchical hegemony in the form of a U.S. President Ron Paul. The heads of the New World Order's planning bodies are simply, themselves, largely isolationistic from any views outside their own. Ron Paul's message of peace is catastrophically fatal to the plans for a global government of the New World Order that depend on wars, rumors of wars, disease, poverty, and death. Restationing all the U.S. military troops currently abroad back home within the U.S. borders will break the DoD and Pentagon's military empire, and without the threat of state force, the coercion by rackets such as the Federal Reserve and IMF will lose all authority.